my love. I am so happy and so pleased to announce that this episode is brought to you by my very own company, Savage Chocolates, which is all about cultivating a more loving relationship to your body and to food. You know, we don't really believe in guilty pleasure. We just believe in pleasure done well. Right? Have you ever had that uh, candy bar or a thing of ice cream and you eat it and you're like, wait, I don't, I don't remember eating that. <laughs> wait, where'd that go? <laughs> well, that's why I created Savage Chocolates because I know the importance of pleasure. And I think that we don't slow down enough to actually experience it. And so... If you are wanting to eat mindfully, if you are wanting to be reminded of how to actually experience your pleasure, then please go to www.savagelosangeles.com to order your goods. All right, you guys, let's get to it. Diane, Diane Bondi, thank you so much for coming on Savage Lifecast and sharing your gloriousness with us. Oh, you're sweet, Alexa. Thank you for having me. I can't believe that we are connecting after all these years. It's been, um, I want to say seven years that since Easy. our, right? Since it's, our dive shoot together. It's really wild. Yeah. So for those of you who are like, what are we talking about? Diane and I did a photo shoot for Gaiam, the yoga brand and did like, and actually those stories were really sweet. Like they did yeah, like full, like... like stories on us. They're yep. available on YouTube. If anyone would like to check them out, just type in our name and guy and it'll come up. But, um, but that was really a special, special moment. It was. And that's, not, that's how we met. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. guy at the time was extending their sizing yes. and they had reached out to a friend of mine, Melanie Klein, um, from the yoga and body image coalition. I was in the car when she, when they called and said, listen, we'd like to put something together. And um, Melanie said, Hey, you know, we should do this, have some, you know, have some diverse bodies in yoga clothing. Cause seven years ago, we weren't really doing that. No, it was pretty new. It was yeah. like a pretty big deal. Yeah. It was um, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. So I always start this podcast with the question of I firmly believe that like we take our mess and we turn it into a message. Like that's part of, that's part of like, I feel like we do what we do because like we had a problem to solve or like we want to help other people with the problem that we used to have. So I would love to know a little bit, just go right for it. What is, what's your story? Like what's the, what's like the mess and then how have you turned that into a message? Yeah, the mess was, I was practicing yoga at home my entire life and went into a yoga studio and noticed that nobody else looked like me in the yoga studio. There were no brown bodies, there were no fat bodies, and there was really this narrative of yoga for beautiful people, right? Mm. Like a really yoga for the purpose of beauty, yoga to look good on social media, yoga to be on the front of a magazine doing some kind of acrobatic posture. And I thought to myself, that's not the way I was taught it by my mom or that's not the way that I learned it. And where are all the other people besides the, you know, the picture perfect stereotypical yoga body at that particular moment in time. And I just got really irritated by it. And so I wrote an article for elephant journal in, I believe it's 2012 um, that said yoga isn't just for skinny white girls. Cause I was just really irritated that that's yeah. all I was seeing everywhere and anywhere. And I felt very left out of the conversation and it blew up on elephant journal in a minute. And it had like thousands of comments from people who also had felt Um, marginalized in this practice. And at the time, there was a movement called Decolonizing Yoga. And they were out there calling out how yoga had been whitewashed and how yoga was lacking, you know, was steeped in ableism and heteronormative, uh, uh, you know, narration and, you know, very much that able-bodied acrobatic thing. And what about all these other people who also deserve to be part of that practice? And the sheer erasure of South Asian culture from Mm -hmm. the practice, like this this hyper-focus, like really this hyper-focus on the one 
the one arm or the one branch, right? That, that asana branch, like that, this, that, that's all that it was about. And we all know that that's not the case. And so I started speaking out about that and creating trainings around accessibility. So if you weren't in this able-bodied or if you weren't super flexible, if you weren't athletic, what, what do you do in these classes when the instructor says, okay, from downward facing dog, we're going to pike up into handstand. Are we, are we, are we, are we, are we <laughs> I know really? I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah. Really? Is that, what, is that what we're doing? Um, and so I really wanted to change the narrative, um, at least for my students and for people who look like me, that this practice was also available to you. And there was so much more of it than just this super able-bodied, you know, good-looking, model-esque, fitness model kind of genre to it, that there was so much depth and so much more wisdom. So that's the problem I wanted to fix. I wanted to see more people like me teaching yoga. I wanted to see lots of different bodies when I went to class. I wanted to feel included in a practice that was created by brown bodies. I wanted to be part of that. And I wanted to acknowledge that. And so that was the problem I designed to fix. And then you know, you and I got the call to do the the Gaim Yoga brand um, clothing shoot, which was extending its sizing, and I hadn't seen that yet. And it was you were starting to see the rise of Jessamine Stanley and all that stuff going on. So yes. it was it was kind of at the beginning of that whole movement, and so that that was the problem I wanted to solve. Yoga had to look like everyone and not just like certain people. So. Yes. I got such like, I got energized when you were talking about that. that was, I was like, I like almost teared up <laughs> crying. Um, that's really, really beautiful. And, and so powerful. You call yourself uh, on your Instagram bio because that's what we go by these days. Right. Our Instagram yeah, bio. Sure. It, um, like- yeah, truly is a, a disruptor. Mm-hmm. I'd yeah, love to like- hear about what that means. I like to stick my finger, my face and my opinion into a lot of things, whether yeah. <laughs> like when I, you know what I mean? When I see the status quo being embraced, I'm always like, Mm-mm, we're not doing that. What about these people? I like to speak up and ask, you know, my Instagram page isn't designed to make people feel really good. There's not a lot of, there's some feel good stuff on there, but most of it is around, let's think about what's actually going on in the world. Let's think about okay. how we're contributing to the oppression of others. Let's look at the yes. other side of things. Let's broaden our lens of what we're looking at. Let's broaden our awareness. And so that's why I like to disrupt. I, I I wanted to disrupt the narrative that yoga belonged to, you know, a certain able body, you know, set mm-hmm. of people and say, no, 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 there's the rest of us here. So that's kind of my, my thing. I, I just get involved in, in places where I think inclusivity, um, equitable, equi- equability, I don't even know if that's a word, um, is not happening. And I'd like to stick my finger in those things. I like to poke a hole in those things. Like today, um, at the time that this podcast is being recorded, it's technically Canada Day. And that's the celebration pretty much of the colonization of Canada. And I've wow. decided to opt out of that. And a couple of weeks ago, I kind of started saying on Instagram, it's time for us to like really Canadians to stop thinking we're so superior to everybody else and open the door to the skeletons in our own closet figuratively and literally at this point as they're excavating residential schools in Canada and finding uh, mass unmarked graves of poor first nation and indigenous children who were murdered um being having their culture stripped from them in a residential school so maybe not celebrating canada day this year maybe in deep reflection and celebrating maybe indigenous heritage and educating ourselves on how canada shows up in the world when we're not put on the world stage as some utopian society because we're not and we have to stop looking down our nose at americans because we've got lots of issues here too and that's a lot of the canadian perspective a lot of the canadian identity is that we're not americans so we didn't have slavery yes we did we don't have racism yes we do like you know what i mean we play a really good game and we have a really good pr team so it's time to burst the (laughs) bubble yeah Time to burst the bubble around that. That's that's me disrupting. It's time to burst that bubble and show everybody who you really are. I live for your disruptions. Mm. <laughs> I live, honey. Like yeah. it's so light good. shit on fire. Just light shit on fire. Light it up. Like <laughs> yeah. Expose it. It's yes. Like, yeah. I, I, I just had this amazing um, woman on the podcast. I interviewed her actually yesterday, but um, she's coming out with a book called Revealed by Darkness. Ooh. And it's like, it, it's in essence, like, it's like the shit that we like try to hide is like mm-hmm. actually where, like, that's where the, the healing is. That's where the growth is. That's where everything is. 100%. Like, like yep. get out of the shadow, dude. Like, just take it out. 
Yeah. Kapow. Shine light on it. Right. Like Absolutely. that's the thing. We, we run away from who we really are when we actually have a lot to learn. And, you know, people are like, well, this, I didn't do this. And why do I, you know, this didn't happen and I'm not responsible. Nobody is asking anybody to put their head on the chopping block for what their ancestors did. But what we are asking is an acknowledgement of what your ancestors did and how yeah. that shapes the policies and the way we look at the world now, right. and maybe starting to unpack how you got to where you are in the world based on these things that happen to Indigenous people, to Black people, to people of color all over the world. We just want some acknowledgement, and we yes. also want our stories to be told the same way your stories have been told for generations. Like, I don't think that's asking a lot. And to just be aware it's of these actually things. Actually, the bare minimum. Right? You would, yeah. We're just like, asking you to be aware of these things. And not to mention the ownership of, of now how, like how that actually still shows up, not mm -hmm. only as a society, but also as an individual, like we mm -hmm. talk about shadow, like we all have things that are subconscious, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Mark Wool, and he wrote a book called It Didn't Start With You and talking about like generational yeah, belief systems and trauma. Yeah. And yeah, like, yeah. yeah, fuck yeah. So like whatever is in our genetic code yeah up to 13 generations back like, is living in you so like yeah even if you don't if you think like you're all clean yeah you're not like you're, you're really not like there's no. stuff to excavate and that's and people are afraid to do that because then it makes them question who they really are you know everybody would like to think that they've gotten to the place in the world based solely on their own hard work and their own right. perseverance we all want to believe that and to a Dude. certain extent that that's true that's true but you've also had a leg up in a lot of situations and yeah. it's time to acknowledge that leg up and offer that back to the people who don't have the same leg up right. um, and that's called reparations it doesn't necessarily mean a dollar amount but it does mean that we start to break down the systems of oppression that are happened systemically throughout the social uh, the um, criminal justice system right. the court system the healthcare system the way we create wealth changing yeah. the structures that keep people from having access to that is the first step and i think reparations i completely agree i like you and i were just talking about my potential business venture in mm -hmm. you know in oregon and it's yeah. like well like here i am like a white girl like doing things that like people of color are in prison for now totally. you know and it's like i want to create a dialogue around that like i, I don't want to like stifle my desire to do that but i do i if it's not done with intention and with with a conversation around that and also making reparations in whatever way possible whether that mm -hmm. is through um, through the criminal justice system, whether that is through, um, you know, signing documents and trying to get the court to change, whether that is through actual preparations by paying people or hi mm -hmm. hiring people, like the awareness around that. And I still have so, I have so much to learn. Like I have, we all so, do. We all we do. All do. We all like, do. We all do. The, the problem is, is when we say I don't have anything to learn, you know, like when we're right. like, oh, got it. Got it. We don't want to, or I yeah. know better than you, or that right. didn't happen to me, or my ancestors didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> the best one. I've heard so many white people say that. Oh, my ancestors didn't Never even have slaves. slaves or, uh, yeah, exactly. But you still benefit from the systems from in the place. System. Like, capitalism was created by slavery, right? right? That's like the first, that's like one of the first pillars. That's yeah. how America went from being a new colony Right. to a superpower in less than a hundred years. Free work, baby. Like, totally. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah, Come exactly. Now. Not to mention the privilege of being able to say my ancestors didn't have slaves. You, oh, you know what your ancestors did or didn't yeah. do? That's funny. Like yeah. those people don't know what their ancestors, like they don't know about their ancestry. Because... They don't even know what tribal groups that they belong to. They don't know what their, oh. and history is always told from the from the perspective of the, of the conqueror. It's never told right. by the perspective of the vanquished. And- right. So you never know. And a lot of American history is often taught around exceptionalism. We all know who Martin Luther King is. For we sure. all know who Malcolm X is. We all know who Rosa Parks is. But sure. what, about, what about the person who invented the first refrigerated truck? 
that helps you get ice cream to your grocery store without yes. that? Or what about the person who created the stop sign or the traffic light? We don't hear about those people, mm-hmm. right? Like we don't hear about the totality of, of history of, of black history or people of color. Right. We hear about the exceptional, you know, uh, instances in history or exceptionalism. And that's yeah. the problem. We need to know the whole story totally. and we can't, we can't have healing without accountability and accountability starts with admitting stuff and telling the truth. It's just like anything. It's like you have an alcohol problem. Like first step, you have to admit it. I admit that I have a problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. Yeah. Like, that's where it all, it always begins there. And mm-hmm. here we are, you know, in this wild time of like a, a totally abolishing critical race theory in schools. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> we, could, we could go on, on this for years. Um, yeah, yeah. We don't want to hear the truth because it makes us feel bad about ourselves. And this idea that holding, you know, the dominant culture accountable for becoming the dominant culture is a problem. We we're, it, It's not. We need to know how we got where we are so that we don't continue to perpetuate the problems. And it's I think it repeats good. itself. Yeah, right? Like we need to pay attention. And we're in this era of, you know, not telling the truth and that being completely okay, which scares me. It's super scary. I I would love to hear from your perspective, the intersection Mm -hmm. of not just asana yoga, but yoga in general, the whole eight limbs and then some, um, and social justice and body awareness and fat phobia, all of that. (laughs) All the things. All of it. (laughs) It, It's all super intertwined. I think when, uh, when I started out with my yoga practice, I started out as a three-year-old, right? So my mother was doing yoga as the, as part of that whole culture, uh, counterculture, right? It was like the early 70s. I was born in 1970. And so it wasn't something that there were yoga studios and yoga mats and the way we see yoga commercialized now. It was just a practice that we did together that my mother had found when she was in nursing school that just helped her get through nursing school. And from that point of helping me understand who I was and helping me sit in deep reflection of who I was, when I started studying yoga more and more, I saw that it was giving us a tools. It was giving us a life plan of how to show up in the world as a more complete human being. And as I started looking at the layers of my life and removing some of the things that I believed, it really helped me to see the truth. And I think the story that was most impactful or the epic poem, I should say, that made everything most impactful was the Gita. And what the Gita had taught me was that it was very important to to know what your Dharma is, to learn what your Dharma is, and then to move out in the world and do it. And I've always been a critical thinker and I've always been a person who's pushback. I fought with my dad from the time I was three years old because he really had some ideas about how women should behave and how women should look. And I was really big on pushing back on those things because I helped, yoga helped me know who I was. And I wanted that for everyone. And I wanted people to understand, um, you know, yourself as a, as a divine entity and an entity that could create change. So that was really what I learned in yoga. And when I saw that yoga in the West was really being commercialized and commodified and was really stepping away from the system of learning how to show up as a better human being in the world and learning to fight um, injustice and actually listening and sitting in your truth, Satcha, and I saw that wasn't happening, then I thought to myself, somebody has to speak out about it. And whenever I say that, that means that I have to do it. But I'm like, why is isn't anybody doing anything? Oh, oh shit. That Andrew. means that I have to do something. The minute I ask myself that question, then I'm thinking, okay, I'm asking this question, so I'm going to step up. This must must be my dharma. And so I had to take a hard, long look at what I believed, what I believed about my body in a system that just hates fatness, where there are whole careers that are dedicated to eradicating fatness. There are whole medical devices that are that are um, created to to get to you know to destroy fatness because fatness is this horrible thing that nobody should be, and that's not yeah. true, right? Absolutely. You know, our bodies, however they have been developed, are part of our divine self. And no matter what you eat and no matter how much exercise you do and no matter how much starving you do, everybody has their own particular biology and body type, right? And we have to celebrate that. There is no thin person trying to fight their way out of a fat person, which was often what I heard in the 70s and 80s. Mm. We have to respect 
this um, a friend of mine calls it a meat sack, but we have to expect, totally. right? <laughs> totally. That this is hundreds of thousands of years of ancestry and evolution that has created this body that is particular to you. And that's a miracle in and of itself. Yes. And it doesn't matter what that body looks like. And we don't owe the world beauty and we don't owe the world thinness and we don't owe the world any of that. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I learned from my yoga. I owe the world to show up and do the right thing. I owe the world to fight back against, um, you know, injustice. I owe the world the truth of, you know, our existence. And if I'm busy being preoccupied with trying to lose weight or, you know, uh, saying. parents, then I can't fight what's actually wrong with the world. So it's, right. it's a trick, right? The whole thing around body image is a trick to keep 51% of the population, um, mostly women, but this happens to all genders, you know, focused on the wrong things. We really saw you know, that whole narrative around what you look like very emphasized anytime women at the time were trying to assert their power. So we saw this real connection to body shaming around the time that uh, particularly white women were looking for the right to vote. You know, they were saying things like, why do these women want the right to vote? Because they're ugly and they can't get a man and all this kind of stuff, like planting these ideas to deter Ooh. women. Yeah, they want to get the right to vote, right? There's, there's, all this, there's all this stuff going on that we don't know about, right? right. And so right. those are all the things that were intersectional for me around yoga was knowing your truth, was showing up for other people, was um, calling out things that aren't true when people were lying. All those things were deeply connected to my practice of satya. All those yes. things were deeply connected to my, my practice of ahimsa. All of those things mm -hmm. were deeply connected to my practice of asana, like all of those things. Totally. In, you know, in finding that. So it was easy to make those connections around body image and social justice because it, it really was taught in those texts. It totally. really... But it really was there for, like I said, if you're paying attention and you're reading, uh, you know, the text, the, the Upanishads, the Vedas, if you're really studying all that stuff, it's an excellent guide on how you can live your life. And it shows you that you're, the body that you're in is an extension of your, your divine self or an extension of the divine. And we need to respect it. It's worthy of respect, right? Without a doubt. Yeah, when we're spending so much time obsessing over this body, that's really just the vehicle to get done what we're supposed to get done. We get done. We don't get as much done. It, it's true. And that's the whole <laughs> idea, to keep you distracted, to keep right. you unhappy. And it's we all know- a patriarchal system. Society, exactly. Like, you know, Alan and I, that's my, my husband, we were out for a walk yesterday because it, it wasn't super humid here. So we went out for a walk. Nice. And I remember when I was growing up, how marriage was a life goal. <laughs> totally. Um, and I don't think that should be a life goal. If you want to get married, great, right? I've been married for 21 years. Do whatever makes you happy, but Amazing. I don't think it should be a life goal. I know Amazing. I'm going to probably get hate for that. Oh, um, but no. <laughs> I, mean, if you, I mean, if you do, like, God bless you, whoever you yeah, are. Exactly. Like, live and be I, well, yeah. but like, yeah, live and be exactly. well somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think we should have loftier life goals, like making the place better for all of us, right? What a concept. I know. And right? if, that, if that world is better by you having a partner and that feels supportive, then like, great. Perfect. Go ahead do and do it. it. I'm not totally. saying don't get married. I'm not saying that. Right. I'm just saying that we should have really uh, life goals that empower all of us. Like let's yes. show up as a community for each other yes. instead of constantly being caught up in our own selves. Yes. In our own bullshit. Yeah. And also like a life goal of like accepting and loving ourselves completely so that we can do that from an authentic place. That's a good life goal. Absolutely. You know, like, like fully, like fully embodying myself, no matter what myself looks like, mm -hmm. seems like whatever experience, like accepting that so that I can take that self into the world and be of service. Exactly. exactly. That's a pretty good goal. Right? Like, what is, what is your legacy? What is your purpose? Right. Why are you here? You're not here just to create more people to consume. No. Um, we're here to really illuminate and lift up humanity in all of its forms, right? Yes. In all of its forms. And humanity takes on many forms, and we want to embrace that. Yes. I was talking to a, a friend of mine um, who was actually on the podcast as well, um, Dr. Adi Jaffe. 
His Ooh. name is so fun. It um, is. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue like music. It's very yeah, music. Totally. You got to like say it with a like, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. He's a lovely Israeli man, but um, hence the name. But we were talking about gravestones mm. and how like the thing that we're obsessed about, like the things that, that were like, like imagine if your life goal was marriage and on your headstone, someone was like, and she did it. She got married. <laughs> you know, like if your right. life goal is like to be thin, like, right? Oh, be so thin. Like you right. want that shit on your headstone? Like hopefully what you want is like, she was a powerhouse, like badass, loved everybody. She was devoted to humanity. Yeah, she devoted to service. The like world. she was devoted in service. Left yeah. the world better than when she better. got here. Like yeah. that's the shit we want on our headstone. Not like she worked all the time. Right. <laughs> like, and she died working yeah. and yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. It's that's like head, headstones. Yeah. Um I want to hear a little bit more around if it feels good for you. <laughs> I want to hear it. I um, want yeah. to yeah. <laughs> do it. Um, right. I would love to hear more about your relationship to body image mm. and and really like in, integrating self-love enough and ex- mm. body acceptance and why it's so important. I, I know we just touched on like, you know, the patriarchy and all of that, but right. it, it's such a powerful message of yours. And I, I just, I, I wish that I knew somebody, I wish I knew one person mm. that had like a perfect relationship to their body. Yeah. That's not happening. I think mm-hmm. anywhere in the world, I think <laughs> we, uh, we have really been trained and conditioned to be in, in deep, um, in deep hate or at least in deep conflict constantly with our bodies. And when I'm talking about that, I'm, I'm going to speak on like size. I'm going to speak from what I know because I fully understand and have a lot of empathy for people who are born into the wrong bodies at birth. And I know that's a whole nother whole thing, other thing. That I am, yeah, that I'm not qualified to speak on. Um, but I will speak on, you know, showing up in a black body or showing up in a fat body. Those are the things that I, I can completely relate to. Um, learning to be in acceptance of the body you in, you're in is a practice, right? And I think people think because some days they wake up and, you know, they think they feel great and they look great and they go out into the world however they want. And then other days they wake up and they don't like the roll in their belly or they don't like the nose on their face or whatever it is. And that somehow they're failing in the game of um, not necessarily the game or in the practice of, of body I hate to use the word body positivity because that's such a watered down kind of word, or let's say like fat acceptance or acceptance of where you are. And you have to learn that it's a practice that not every day you're going to wake up and feel great about yourself, but that you're going to acknowledge when you wake up and you have those feelings. Because I think prior to that, those feelings were maybe always underlying, but they were normalized by society. So to say that you hate your thighs was like, good for you. And that means you need to do something about them as opposed to this is my body and I'm good with it. Uh, you know, my big hashtag is thick thighs, save lives, thick right. thighs, rule the skies, thick thighs, save cell phones, whatever, whatever that is <laughs> that I'm saying at the moment. But this whole understanding that learning to become comfortable with your size or your skin color or whatever it is, is a practice. And some days it's going to be hard because we live in a world that puts a lot of value on what we look like. And we live in a world that puts a lot of value in being a certain body type. So I was just doing some research before I jumped on uh, the podcast and the BBC had a, uh, I don't want to call it a documentary because I just think it's garbage. A few years ago, the race to size zero, and they followed a couple of women who were dieting them themselves down to an impossible size of wow. size zero from wherever they were. And we were really supporting that. And I just remember back in the early 2000s, we were doing things like extreme makeover and extreme weight loss. And we were doing yes. all these really harmful things and it was totally okay to do in society which just goes to show you how much we've changed in the last five to seven years and that we are coming back around again and what I love about seeing on Instagram in particular is how many non-diet dietitians are out there how many people are actually telling the truth about BMI how that's not actually based in any real science and that 
pure bullshit. It's pure bullshit. I call it the bullshit measuring index. That's what I call it. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And how much havoc that has, that has, you know, wreaked on women in particular, but everybody in the world by being held up to a mathematical standard that has no evidence of anything. And it's not a marker of health. And it's funny, whenever I put up anything that is uh, pushes against fat phobia or asks people to, you know, to embrace all kinds of bodies, I always get that one health troll always saying things like, aren't you glorifying? obesity and I thought to myself if shaming people in in their body if shaming people actually worked right. everybody would be the exact same size we would all eat the exact same thing and look the exact same way and I yep. really think there's whole industries dedicated to that and so I wanted to do the switch of that let's just yes. celebrate the bodies that we're in let's be grateful for whatever it is that our bodies can do let's let's show up and do movement because it feels good let's eat the things that make us happy happy and let's let go of toxic diet culture and this idea that we're all supposed to look like a supermodel or for women that you're all supposed to look like somewhere in your mid 30s to early 40s for the rest of your effing life like right. it's just like come right. on already like God, it's, it's, it's so rich thing and it's it makes so rich it's and it makes so much money for people who are just trying to sell you something to make right. you feel better about yourself. It is all run by capitalism. Yeah. So I want to get to the totally. point where some days you love your body, some days you don't, and that's okay because it's a practice. Right. But on the days that you don't, reach out to the people around you who love you and support you and get your positive reinforcement from that. Don't start going on Instagram and looking for ways no. to feel bad about yourself because you'll find them. Oh, easily. Those concern, I call them concern trolls. Ugh, they're, they're concerned. My, uh, a good friend of mine um, posted a picture where she actually looked like really thin. It was like the angle that she, she did this like weird. And the lighting. Make, and the lighting whatever. and the whole thing. And people were like, she looks a tad unhealthy. Oh my God. Like, why are we, what? Like as if, if she were unhealthy, like you saying she looks unhealthy is like, she's going to be like, oh fuck, I'm unhealthy now. Got right? it. I got I mean, give me a sandwich. Like, like, yeah, like yeah. a perfect, a perfect stranger on the internet right. has something to say to me and I'm supposed to listen to this person. Yeah. Like, honestly, and that goes for oh, yeah. me on the internet. I'm a complete stranger here on the internet. Tell you stuff. You don't got to believe me. Right. But if you, but if you're following me, then like, yeah. there's a reason you're following me. I like, oh. You know what I mean? Like, listen or, or get away. Like, or go away. Like, yeah. listen. Like, honestly, I'm not here to convince you of anything. Yeah. I'm just here to share the facts with you, share my perspective. And yes. if it jives with you, great. Let's keep no. moving forward. And if it doesn't, there's a billion other people on the internet that you can go follow that will align with whatever it is that you believe. Without a doubt. And like, go I'm not find for everybody. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not for everybody, and I'm not Thank trying you. to be. Good. I love it. Same. Yeah. The BMI stuff is so triggering. I remember when I was like very, very sick, like very anorexic mm -hmm. and the BMI told me that I was in a normal range. Yeah. And it was like, I, so I had this thing. I was like, no, no, no. I'm like, I'm normal. Mm -hmm. And it was like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, yeah. No, absolutely not. Like, Hard no. So like if anyone is listening who's like, but the BMI says, no, no. fuck the BMI. Exactly. Dying. Dying. It and it was supposed to measure populations and not individuals. Yeah. And I remember, I want to say in the late 90s, perhaps early 2000s, don't quote me, do your own research here, okay. uh, that it was augmented again, which um, somehow they switched it up and made everybody even thinner. So wow. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's just... It's a lot of garbage and it's wreaked so much havoc. And yeah. I honestly believe it is um, the basis for a lot of disordered eating. Oh, no doubt. Oh, it kept me stuck for sure. I was like, no, 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 I can, I can eat 150 well, calories According a day. to this arbitrary yeah. bullshit here, I'm like, I'm, I'm perfect. Like, I'm, 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 you know, my hair is falling out. And yeah, I, I don't have a period, but like, it's all good. Yeah. But it's good because I'm, I'm in the same range, right? Yeah. Keep it, keep it clean over here. We're keep, we're yeah. I'm just clean eating. I'm right. clean. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. That, there's lots of ways. And that's the problem is that society reinforces this disordered eating as normal. As normal. And so you have 
right? You have lots of excuses to say, well, according to you name the bullshit diet that's out there, I'm doing all the right things. And you can always find that pseudoscience to back up anything. And that's the problem with the internet. You can find any obscure point and find something to back it up. So you have to ask yourself, what are your legitimate resources? Where are you looking for your information? Why do you need to prove this so so badly and really at the end of the day how do you feel in your body like when you I was just gonna say it right when you move and when you eat how do you feel and that should be the litmus test right you know I'm in a plus size body I was out running this morning and somebody else ran by me in a plus size body and we did the you know the yes you can't you know the peace sign on the way back and you know I'm sure people are watching us run and and saying well good for you out there trying to lose weight I'm not (laughs) running trying to lose weight I'm running because most days I like it some days I really hate it and everything else is kind of in between but it's good for my blood pressure it's good for my mood it gets me out in nature it gets me moving it shakes off stress it reduces my anxiety and so looking for ways to move our body that's not connected with changing our body is something else that helps us to stay in the loop of the practice of, you know, coming to peace with your body. No fucking doubt. I mean, that is the, my relationship to movement has shifted so much over the years. It used to be such a punishment. It's like the, uh, now I do things that I really enjoy. Like we were talking before the podcast, it's like, I fucking hate running. Um, yeah. But like, I love to box. It makes me feel powerful. You know, like I love to dance. It makes me feel sexy. Like what? those things make me feel good. So yeah. like, I will do them, <laughs> you know? Exactly. And that's what we want to do. I've become obsessed during the pandemic with the Peloton app. I don't have oh. a bike because I refuse. Yeah pay that much money for a stationary bike but I have my stationary bike in here and I've got my Peloton app and I do that because the it's fun like I'm dancing on my bike you know I now take up gardening I know I'm getting older because I now enjoy gardening so I like going out and gardening you know what I mean I like I, I do the things I like to do and that's it that's and I do it without, and the same thing for food. I eat the things I like to eat without shame or guilt. I yes. am, I've done that. You, I think sometimes you get to a certain age and you're just like, I'm all done. This. God, someone's, uh, I was called a, I was called a grandma on TikTok recently, which was amazing. Someone was like, who's this grandma? Cause like, it's like a bunch of 16 year olds. I was like, oh, go on. And yeah, I just, that's right. Respect yeah. your elders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I said, I take that as a compliment, first oh. of all, like fantastic. Oh. And I was like, you could not pay me enough money to go back to my twenties. Oh, me neither. <laughs> like, not in this world too. I think not. I had it much easier in my twenties. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be a 20 year old now. <laughs> N-O spells no. Just like yeah. Hard and fast, no. <laughs> like, I'm out of here. Um, wow. Well, I just looked at the clock. I'm like, wow, it's already been 40 minutes. Um, I usually try to keep it around 40, 45. Yeah, I feel um, you. I would love to know three books that changed your life. Oh, yeah. The first book that I would say has had a really integral relationship with uh, my body, helped me create a real integral relationship with my body, was Health at Every Size by Dr. Lindo Bacon. Uh, The first 36 pages of that book changed my life around what I believed about dieting, what I believed about uh, diet culture, and it dispelled a lot of myths that we had out in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Another book that I love that I've been reading is by... um, Dr. Sabrina Strings. Um, and I live. Yeah, I, I, I see I'm it. Looking for, I'm looking for it here on my bookshelf because it's usually really close at hand and it's really usually on my book, but it's um, it's the origins of fat phobia mm. and its racial impli- in implications around that. So it really wow. unpacks where we become fat phobic. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And then finally, the great work of your life. And that's a book that I, you know, um, that I finding your true calling. This is something that I really love. I've got like notes in the margins. It's just been an incredible, incredible guide. Is that Arjuna on the front? I wonder. Yeah. Yeah, it really uses the, um, I'm a big fan of the Gita. So I have to say the poem, the Gita has had a huge influence on my life, but this has been an amazing book. If you haven't had a a chance to read it, it's by Stephen Cope, The Great Work of Your Life. Uh, I know he used to work at Kripalu. I don't know if he does anymore, but I I do love this book. That's how I got introduced to him because I did Seva at Kripalu for like six months. Oh, okay. Okay. So you've met him. Like he's- Amazing. Yeah. 
So, so good. Oh, I so love that. And then three books that you wish everybody would read besides mm-hmm. those three, if there are three more. So you want to, so you, uh, so you want to talk about racism. Yes. Um, uh, that was my, that was my, um, introduction. Introduction. I think that's really good. My grandmother's hands. I really appreciate that book. Oh my gosh. I've heard about that book, but I haven't read it yet. Yes. And cast, um, the origins of our discontent. So mm-hmm. those are three books that I think if you're interested in social justice work and, you know, getting to the point where we can start to unpack and eliminate racism, those are books that can really help you, um, see, like see what's going on in the world. Cause I think we do live with these rose colored glasses and we do believe yeah. that maybe being non-racist is enough, but we need to become anti-racist if we want to really make the world an equitable place for lots of people. So Absolutely. those books I wish everybody would read. Okay. Beautiful. Everyone take notes. I'll put them in the show notes too. Okay. So I always end with the book questions, but I also end with like a little bit of a rapid fire round where I just okay. like ask you to kind of fill in the blank or choose either or. So are we down? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm rubbing my hands. I'm ready. She's ready. She's ready, y'all. She's ready. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) Coffee or tea? Tea. Sex or sleep? Sleep. (laughs) I love you. Um, Chocolate or like Sour Patch Kids? Chocolate. Yes. I'll have to send you a package. I'm going to send you a package. Please. My chocolate. Please. I'm on on it. Um, New York or LA? If you've been to either. Yeah, same. Same, honestly. Sorry, yeah. LA. Sorry, same. Sorry, LA. Yeah, um, I like California, but New York. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, desert or ocean? Ocean. Love it. Um, yeah. To me, wellness is? Taking care of yourself, however that looks for you. I believe in yes. well-being more than wellness. I feel like wellness has become something that's very commercialized and it feels like you have to have money to participate in wellness, but well-being can be standing in the grass with your shoes off or eating delectable chocolate like I know you have or yes. taking a nap, things that are hopefully accessible, a little bit more accessible than going to the spa for a day. Not that that's not wellness. It's just not something that we all can always participate in. So well-being is anything that, you know, reduces stress in your life. So I love that. Okay. To me, yoga is uh, the pathway to a better life for all of us. Hey, Hey. Um, (laughs) right now I'm the most grateful for my family. Uh, it's been a weird year and a half in this pandemic and I, we've all been sequestered in our house. Our house isn't very big, but it's nicely set up so we can hide from each other when we've had enough. So yeah, (laughs) everybody's got their own space to kind of hide from everybody. So I'm grateful that this pandemic brought us closer together. Diane Bondi, where can we find you as well? The easiest place to find me is on my website at dianebondyyoga.com. And I'm not sure when this um, podcast is coming out, but I am going to be out there on the West Coast for the Mammoth Yoga Festival. Ooh, oh, I just heard about that. Yes. Maybe I so. saw it on your page. <laughs> I might have seen it on you. <laughs> That's awesome. Like New York, I still like California too. It's yeah. just... So yeah, and you can find out everywhere I'm doing. I'm also on social media as Diane Bondi Yoga Official. I'm most active on Instagram, but I'm also on TikTok being a great grandmother. And I'm not so good with Twitter, but I'm on there too. (laughs) I'm not good at Twitter either. I think I have like four followers on Twitter. I don't tweet, but but I have it. I just like don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and your wisdom and for how you show up on the planet. It's really powerful. Thank you. Right back at you. And I'm digging your mini mic moments. So keep that up. Mini mic drops. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for having me. All right, you guys, thank you so much for carving out the time to listen to this wisdom, to listen to uh, all this goodness. Um, once again, gentle reminder to please check out savagelosangeles.com to learn more about my new company that I'm so proud of. I hope it inspires you to create and cultivate a life that you dig. Um, and also if you are down and have, you know, oh, I don't know, 10 seconds, then please, please give this podcast a five-star review on iTunes. Super easy. Just give it five stars, maybe say a few kind words. And if you dug it, please share it with your friends. I would be over the moon with gratitude. Um, All right. You guys are the bee's knees. Much love. Stay savage.